All right, I'm going to transition us to a time of tithes and offerings. And the verse I'm going to use today is from Romans 12. And it says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So I don't know about you guys. Romans is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's just filled with amazing things. Um, and it is an epistle. So little Bible lesson here if you guys don't know. Paul wrote the epistles to the different churches that were starting out. And so, like, Corinthians is the church in Corinth. Romans is the church in Rome. Good answer. You guys are smart. And a lot of times when he wrote the epistles, he was writing them about a specific thing that was going on. It was kind of a backslap to Jesus. Not to Jesus, from Jesus. There he was saying, I've heard that you guys are stealing or backbiting or there's division in the church don't do that anymore. That was a big part of it. But with Rome, this time period was actually before there was a lot of persecution from Nero when he was in power. So Rome was actually doing pretty well. So the thing that stuck out for me in this verse was, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. So in this time, the Romans, I mean, this is still the early church, so there's still persecution, but things were going pretty well for them. And I think that Paul was trying to say here, even when things are going well, don't become complacent. And I think that speaks to us as the church, the Western church, that sometimes it's easy for us to go, okay, well, I've gone to church the last few weeks. Pastor Scott spoke about the tithe. Pastor Brad talked about first fruits. I'm doing both those things. I'm doing great. So I'm good. And that is, that is awesome. But it needs to come from a place where you are giving from that passion, from that zeal of your spirit. So I would just encourage you as the ushers come forward to pass the buckets, as you give tonight, don't let it come from a place of this is what I always do or a habit. Let it come from that zeal in your soul. All right, I'm going to pray for us. Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for that zeal that you've given us, God. Lord, we commit right now that we come to you with what we have. And it comes from deep inside of us, God. It doesn't come from a place of habit. It doesn't come from, this is how I always do things. But Lord, we give with intentionality right now. Lord, we come, we want to give a sacrifice. God, we want to give something that costs us, Lord. And we pray that you would take this gift and you would bless it, Lord. That it would be multiplied as we move forward in your purposes. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for your generosity in giving to the Lord. There are three ways that you can give. First, you can go on our website at lifebiblechurch.org slash giving to give online. Second, you can give on our Life Bible Church app. And lastly, you can give by mailing us a check to the address below. Thank you again for your faithfulness. Now, back to the service. Praise God. All right, well, we, I'm going to skip the uh, articles tonight. Um, I want to I move right into the scriptures. We've, we've got a lot to cover tonight. I want to, uh, we're actually going to read quite a bit in the scriptures. So I want you to, if you have your Bible, you would best to turn to the book of Daniel. We're going to take a look at Daniel and how it feeds into the book of Revelation, especially when we deal with the Antichrist. So, Lord, uh, Help me just to read this afresh. And so let's take a look at Romans. Skip Romans. I, James has got me on Romans here. Uh, and I was so glad that you didn't say the epistles were the apostles' wives. That, that blessed me that you didn't say that. All right, moving on. Uh, Revelation 13, let's read it here. Then I stood upon the sand of the sea. Verse 1. Then I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard in his feet, like the feet, was like a leopard, excuse me, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, 
And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, for he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Just a thought. Have you ever noticed when it says, who is able to make war with him? Isn't that kind of a peculiar statement as he begins to describe this particular thing, that the first thing that he would say is, who's able to make war with him? I mean, that, that seems awful strange to me that that would be the first thing of saying who would be able to stand up to him, who would be able to uh, recognize and unmask, but it went, goes right to what? Power to, uh, to uh, rule the nations and have complete dominion. It's a pretty interesting thought. It says this, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue in this for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God and to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell in the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And here is the patience of and faith of the saints. All right. Well, last week we left you off at page four. You should be at the top. Uh, your notes should be close to say, what did Daniel say in his book? What did Daniel say in his book? And so you have your Bible. I'd like you to turn first to uh, Revelation, or excuse me, Revelation, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. If you have that. Hallelujah. All right. Beautiful. We need to be reminded again that. John, the Apostle John, has eaten the little book of Daniel in the angel's hand. Now you say, well, where did we see that? Well, remember when we finished Revelation, just keep your finger in Daniel 2, Revelation chapter 10, as John is getting the vision from the Lord, I went to the angel, verse 9, chapter 10, Let's look at verse 8. Then a voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again saying, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Please give me, give me the little book. Then he said to me, Take it, eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet in your mouth. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many people's nations tongues and kings. That is where we are connecting the dots. What book could have been open in the angel's hand? And it's none other, we believe, it's none other than the book of Daniel that connects all of the beasts, all of the Antichrist sayings to Daniel. No other book has the kind of hand and glove response of revelation other than the book of Daniel. Even though Zechariah has some ap apocalyptic writing, even though uh, Ezekiel has some end times things, nothing fits the book of Revelation like Daniel. Daniel saw up to a certain point and then his ministry of revelation and the mysteries 
were stopped and he was not allowed to see in. But John picks up exactly where Daniel left off and that was part of the issue. As soon as he reads the book, now this is amazing, as soon as he reads this book in the angel's hand, what do we begin to see? We begin to see all of this understanding about the beast, about the harlot, about pompous words beginning to come up and all sorts of things happening. So until that point, John is getting some understandings about the horses that go out, about the seals that are open, about judgments that are going open. But when he reads that book in the angel's hand, all of a sudden, 11 through 19, and we've told you, uh, and I've, I've kind of made this my fundamental statement, chapters 11 through 19 now open up together and we begin to see the book of Daniel operate in those chapters of 11 through 19. So, as the Apostle John takes up the prophetic events of Daniel and provides fuller details than Daniel did, this is especially when we come to Revelation 13, which we are in, and we're going to look at specifically Daniel chapter 7, but we're going to start probably in Daniel 2. The first thing that we've got to understand is you cannot fully understand the book of Revelation if you don't take, if you're not willing to take Daniel and place Daniel inside the covering of Revelation. So it's almost like da the, 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 the revelation that God gave Daniel has to fit with inside the revelation that God is giving John. John's canopy is fuller and greater, but Daniel's is key. It's almost like a key within a key. And when those keys mix together, they absolutely have something that turns, and I believe, in, in a right perspective of what God is trying to reveal to us. So, when you understand Daniel, you also understand that dreams and the language of the Spirit is very, very real. And so, we have to consider a number of dreams that God gave Daniel the interpretation to a king that represents a type of, of king that represents Babylon or the system of the beast and the Antichrist. So if you're going to understand Babylon and you're going to understand everything that's going to culminate at the end with a Babylonian system... You have to now look at all the things that the Bible says about Babylon. You have to begin to look at and say, okay, what happened in Genesis 11? Well, they built the Tower of Babel. What, I mean, there's a lot to be said about that, but that's the root word of Babylon. It was the first, not just idol, it was the first form of man uniting under a spirit to build a way to God outside of God's way and a monument to self to reach the pinnacle of heaven and say we can have access the way we want and we're like God. See, we can do anything we want. So much so that God said, we better go down and confuse their language for they have put their mind to do something and it was a false way, a false system, and the power of man. And they built not with, that's why God all through the Old Testament said, you cannot build an altar to me with hewn stones. What's a hewn stone? It means that you've had a chisel or an ax or a hammer go on the stones and cultivate those stones. When you build an altar to me, it has to be with unhewn stones. Why? Because the children of that may, Babel at that time the area, they built with bricks. They formed uniform bricks and they used what the Bible says, the slime or the mortar to build uniformity in their whole approach to get toward heaven. And that's why God says, I'm not gonna have any cultivated altar. It has to be, you have to take the things that I've put on the earth without any of man's work in order to approach my throne. It's a big deal. So when we start there and we start to begin to look at Babylon, we have to begin to say, okay, where's the root? Babel in its root had what? Had a unity, had a spirit that something beyond people was able to organize, unify under a purpose that was not God's intention. 
That kind of sounds like the kingdom of Babylon, doesn't it? And so then as you begin to move through, we begin to see in, 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 Daniel's, in Daniel's day what was one of the nations that God used. And isn't it interesting that the two nations that God used to judge the children of Israel because of sin are basically in the same area. Iran, Iraq. Assyria, the Assyrians, really are near the area of Mosul and that area of the upper Iran area of Syria. And that, that, was, that was a nation. And they were the warriors. They were the assassins. It was the bloody city. They were a horrific people. It's who Jonah was sent to. Right? They worshiped the fish god. Who's the fish god? Dagon would be one aspect. Another one, some people say, was Leviathan. Um, but the reality is they were vicious. Who was the next nation? The next nation was right there, which was Babylon. Where's Babylon? Right in the modern day Iraq. Okay? In regard to that, God takes two entities that represent Israel's enemies and complete 180 degrees of what God's plan is and Israel has to come under the judgment of an evil power that represents in its fullness later the fullness of what uh, it means of evil. Babylon is ruled as a system will be ruled by Satan, and the, who is the king of Babylon. Does that make sense? And God does what? He sells his own people because of their sin and rebellion to the king that they actually worshipped. Think about that for a second. They were born to worship God in holiness. They were called out to be separate. But because of their constant rebellion, he gave them for a measure of time to worship who they really were on the inside. Let me say this again. This might mess with your Christian understanding. But God gives his people the king they deserve. Let that sink in for our nation just a bit. He gives us what we really worship in the inside. It's the truth. And when we don't change the way we think to align ourselves with, with the truth, he gives us something of systems and mindsets that we really desire as a nation. Such is the case in Daniel's time. Taken away captive from the land, from the promises taken away from everything that they held dear. Think of it, all the vessels held captive, all the, all the things that were precious, all the victories, all the artifacts that God had done through the years, completely captivated and taken to a foreign land and put in the treasury of foreign gods. And so when we get to Nebuchadnezzar, we look at and this is important, we, we, I want you to see this. In Daniel chapter 2, we, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And the dream represents the image of a massive man. And what, I think you need to understand this because it's connected to Babylon. What does this image of man represent? Well, of course we know as it moves through the different types of metals, it has gold as the head, it has silver as the breast and the arms, it's got bronze in the, at the waist, it's got uh, iron in the legs, and then it's got a mix of iron and clay in the toes. But it is a idol or a statue of what? Man, right? Man representing what? Man that towers over man. An idol of man, representative of everything that would have any value to man, representing the kingdoms of this world, of the nations of power, it represented what? 
the very thing that would be at the very end. What was, the, what was where Israel went was to a place of a nation that actually made this idol, made a bowing to this idol that if you don't bow, it's death penalty. And they made them come under the idol of what? Man. What is the nature of 666? It's man, man, man. Man's image, man's power, man's approach to God. It's the picture of deified man. It is humanism personified, saying whatever man says, whoever has the power, man has the ability to control man, man will cause man to worship man, that's what this is doing. Why? Because Satan desperately wants the worship of mankind to come to him. And he has to have it not on a pure basis, but on a defiled basis. So let's, let's look at this. Okay? We know that in Revelation 13, as we just read, the passage about the false prophet causing the image of the beast for all the world to worship can be better understood, interpreted of the light of Daniel chapters 2 and 3. Let me just go back to Revelation 13 because we're going to do a lot of back and forth tonight. Rev 13. Let me read the second part of Revelation. We stopped at the first part of 13. Let's read the second part of verse, uh, chapter 13. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whom the deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even fire comes down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast and granted to uh, telling those to dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Hmm. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause many of the world, as cause as many, cause, I don't know, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Does that sound like Nebuchadnezzar's image and dream? I think maybe. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is the wisdom. Let him have understanding and calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Why is that? Why is it six? Because man was created on the, what? Sixth day. Okay, now, so we see that. Now look at Daniel chapter two and three. When we look at this dream of Nebuchadnezzar's dream out of Babylon, we need to pay close attention to see the bearing that it has on the kingdom of the Antichrist. God gave Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, a dream of world kingdoms to form the image of, and this is your fill-in, the image of a man. It took a word of wisdom in the interpretation that God gave Daniel to make the meaning known to the king. And the image of deified man is how many see the kingdoms of this world. These world kingdoms were symbolized under various metals, metals that have value according to the values of man, not according to God's values. So as you turn the page and you begin to look at the chart, let's look at this for a second. You can look at the chart where it says the dream of the image of the king of Babylon and the interpretation of the dream to Daniel. And that's coming right out of Daniel chapter 2. <laughs> and, it says, and it says what? Um, 
There is a God in heaven, verse 28 of chapter 2, who reveals secret that he may make known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head on your bed were these. As you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were on your bed that would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what it will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than any living, but for our sakes to make known the interpretation to the king that you may know the thoughts of your heart. O king, you were watching, and behold, a great image whose splendor was excellent that stood before you. Its form was awesome. The image head was of fine gold and its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly clay. And you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors of the wind and carried away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Stop. Does that sound like a dream that was meant for Nebuchadnezzar's day only? It's impossible. Because if those kingdoms, as we're going to see, represent kingdoms of the earth, God was showing Nebuchadnezzar. Now, now, why do I think he was showing this? Because, number one, Nebuchadnezzar, God, God really had a heart to redeem Nebuchadnezzar the man. But Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon was also a, what we would call, there was a, a character behind the king. So even with his great beard and, his, and all of his fine robes, God was speaking past old Nebi and speaking to old Lou. Just like God did in many times with the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre representing it was a dual cameo, meaning that what God would speak to a natural king, he was speaking to a spiritual king behind it. And all through scriptures we find the, the, the law of dual fulfillment, meaning it's speaking to an actual situation in one time frame that only God could deal with, and yet he's speaking to a future issue. He did this with Isaiah multiple times, where is the prophecy about Isaiah and his own children? No, it's about yes and no. It's yes, they're sheer, sheer Jacob, uh, uh, what's the name of it, Charlie? Sheer Isaiah's children. What? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Anyways, anyways, there's a name that he was that he was calling the kids and that name would represent a judgment or something that God would bring to pass in regard to those children. Was it Israel's or was it Isaiah's children? that that happened, yes, but it was speaking to another time of what God would deal with as well, not just a natural scenario. So the Bible is filled with references where God deals with a time frame, but there's a more significant time frame that will actually have fuller fulfillment. And we see this a lot in Daniel because even when we're going to get to the prophecies in Daniel chapter 9, it's speaking to a type and shadow that would come in a natural realm, but yet speaking to a fulfillment that would come in another later realm that Daniel wouldn't have knowledge of. And so because Daniel was getting dreams about the future and about what would take place in world history, isn't it interesting that God also would give the representative king that represented a, the foreign god, represent the beast or, the, or the, the system of that which has fallen, an antichrist system, he would give a natural king a chance to repent with all that he would do, but yet he would speak to the power behind that king and that kingdom and say, and this this is what's going to happen to you, bud, when this is Dover. When Nebi leaves this life, 
What he chooses to do with my grace and my kindness on him will be between his heart and me. But what, who you are, the real king of Babylon, this is what's going to happen. A stone cut without hands. Who would that be? What, what's his name? Well, we know Jesus, but why would he be called a stone? What stone? The cornerstone. The cornerstone cut without hands. The one that would come from the very mountain of God himself would what? Come down and crush the image of the deified man and take Every precious thing that the God of this world used to lure mankind in and scatter it to the wind till it was no more. Well, that's only the end of days. The end of days when then, then the mountain of the Lord says will fill the whole earth. Meaning what? The government, the kingdom of our God in that millennial reign and in the final new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. That is, that is in times past the second coming of Christ even until the new millennial age and the, the eternal age of the kingdom of God dwelling on the earth with man. That was the picture God gave and said, Satan, here's the whole plan. You can build gold, you can build silver, you can build bronze, you can even have a terrible kingdom of iron and a beast that crushes, but here's what's coming. There is a stone being cut, and from that stone made without hands that's been eternity from eternity is going to destroy everything that you put your power in, and nothing will stop the move of God filling the earth. In the end result, that's what will happen. You and all the nations of the world that follow you will bow and be decimated by the authority of the stone that had no human power to it but was the very stone of God. You have to see, the image of man is a deified picture of how Lucifer sees his reign versus the cornerstone in which was meant to be built on. Lucifer or Satan, better reference, he's never called Lucifer after his fall. Satan always looks to worship himself and therefore in mankind he looks to worship and he sits on the throne. Notice what Jesus does. He never comes first to be worshiped. He comes first to be served and to be built upon. Yes, worship is due him, but he comes what? To crush the other stuff by what? Allowing whoever build upon this rock, whoever will fall upon this rock. What's the first thing? A surrendered life. Old, old Satan does what? Worship me and you can have whatever you want. Not the cornerstone. The cornerstone says it's about a yielded life. Come, come build on me. It's a huge picture. Yeah? In my opinion, it hasn't stopped at all. The issue is, again, it's a type and shadow. What you have with the images of silver, gold, bronze, iron, you're going to have a repeat again. That's why we're reading it in the book of Revelation. What was is now augmented with the same values, the same images coming in a final fulfillment. So, John, that's why we're looking at it going, Here's the pattern of how it operated in those ages and now it's going to operate in the last days in the church age with two different kingdoms. One kingdom of Christ. Yep. Okay. So let's just take a look at it. Image of man, the kingdoms of this world, the deified man, head of gold, the king of Babylon. That's who the, king, that's who the head of gold is. The breast and the arms of silver, that's the dual kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. The belly and the thighs of brass represent what? The kingdom of Greece, and I give you scriptures here. 
The two legs of iron represent what? The kingdom of Rome. And then the feet and the ten toes of iron and clay represent the kingdom of Antichrist. Why? Because we're going to see the number ten in play with the Antichrist. And then the stone cut out of the mountain is the kingdom of God in Christ. And the struck of the ten toes and destroyed the image is the destroying of the ten kings that had their hour with the Antichrist in Revelation 19. And the stone becomes a great mountain is the kingdom of God fills the whole earth in Revelation 20. It's an incredible dream that God would give a natural king and he wouldn't just and, and, and I, I'm going to say this, he wouldn't give the full plan up until the end of the ages just to an ungodly king for the sake of being merciful. He was given it to an ungodly king to get to the power that was behind it, to recognize that who you think you are right now, even in, cap, in captivity of taking my temple, my artifacts, my people, I put them in your hand. I put them in there for a season. You will not be able to hold them in the natural for as long as you want, but spiritually, I will come to destroy you. Your rule will not be an ultimate rule. It's a big deal. And in the midst of it, I'm not sure whether, to be honest with you, I'm not sure whether Nebuchadnezzar actually made it. I, I think there's a possibility that he actually is in heaven. Because at the end of his seven years of mental, uh, whew, where he became a beast, he comes back and is a one humbled house dog. He didn't pee on the carpet anymore, I'll tell you that right now. There was no lifting of the leg. He, he, I mean, the reality is, when his mind and his faculties came back, he gave praise to the God of heaven and said there is no one like that. He runs the affairs of men. He stopped all of this jazz and this nonsense that seven years before as he looked out over this and said, I did all this and isn't my kingdom wonderful that I have made for myself. At the end of seven years when he returned and he got his, his, his counselors gave him back his rule, he got his faculties back, his mind back, he lived in a state of humility before the God of heaven. We don't know because there wasn't a revelation of Christ. We assume from the scriptures that that humbling of the heart and the announcement that he actually honored the God of heaven above all gods is a proof positive that Nebuchadnezzar recognized and came under the merciful, mighty, humbling hand of God and stayed there. Unfortunately, his grandchild, his son, and his grandson did not learn anything from his life. So, that's the first chart. When we now look at Revelation 12, 13, 17, confirms the fact that the kingdom of the Antichrist has 10 kings ruling with him. So when I look at this chart, the time element is given in revelation of the 10 toes. The 10 toes of the image and the crushing stone of the kingdom. The stone through smiting the feet actually destroy the whole image. So in the fact that the Antichrist has 10 ruling kings, and we can see that in these scriptures, it is the Antichrist kingdom in existence of when? The Antichrist kingdom now is in, at this time when Jesus returns, it will be the Antichrist kingdom that is now ruling. We just read it. Again, let's, let, let's look at that in Revelation 13. What does it say? It says all power and all authority is granted to him and he makes war with the saints and overcomes them. And authority was given him over every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose name is not recorded in the Lamb's book of life. What are we saying here? We're saying that that rule and that time now is the determiner of the very fact that Jesus Christ is coming back in his second advent. See, that 
I'm going to say this carefully and not try to stir you up too much. Um, but the fact of the matter is that many that have followed the dispensational ideology is the fact that the church gets raptured out in Revelation 6 some go as early as the first part of Revelation 6. Some go up through after the seals are open somewhere and, 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 and certainly are out by the time we hit Revelation 10. But if you follow the fact that possibly there is no two comings of Christ, it's just one final coming. There's not a partial rapture and then a second rapture. There's just one coming of Christ in which we're gathered together with him. If you would follow that theology, then we're saying what? The time of the advent of Christ is somewhere, even though we don't know the day or the hour, is somewhere under the antichrist rule and kingdom. Why? Because there has to be a crushing of the ten figures or the ten toes or the ten kings that are in the rule of the Antichrist rule. That happens during the return of the Lord. That's a big deal. Okay? So what are we saying? These are yet to be fulfilled days. The ten-toed kingdom is the kingdom that resists and opposes Christ at his coming. That's the major connecting point of the dream to the what? To the ten toes. The ten toes on the image of the deified man representing all the nations. Rome, Greece, Medo-Persia represents the culmination of every major power that has been representing the princes and the powers of this world spiritually. Represent the what? Mixture of what? Clay and iron. What would be, what did Jesus say? I'm going to go a little out here on, on you. What did Jesus say would be the evidence that would take place at the return of the Lord? It would be like what? The days of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah? There was a mixing of clay and iron. There was mixing of a super species and a underspecies. Come on, it's the Nephilim. They were ruling. It says that the wickedness of men was so defiled in that day that there was not one righteous thought among the nations. It says just like the days of Noah and just like the days of Lot. What were the days of Lot? That Abraham could not find 10 righteous in the cities to form a government that God could say, I could work with that. He couldn't even get his four or five out altogether because of how permeated the systems of Sodom and Gomorrah came in. And Jesus said in those two things, he said because of that, like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and like the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. What was it? It meant that wickedness permeated to a level that it defiled even to the core and the righteous even fell subject to it. And in the days of Noah, it means that the species that left their abode, that was angelic in order, came in, broke all forms of God's rule and order and lawlessness to take what they wanted and to defile the seed of man with evil. Why do you think the Antichrist, in, the, in a spiritual thing, why do you think he's, they also are waiting for a type of Christ to appear through human birth. What do you think the Masonic, all the things in Washington, D.C., and all the belief systems of the Masonic that go clear back to Luciferianism and go back to the Lucifer is the light. You know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for a person to be incarnate, Satan. That's the whole point. Way down deep inside the very Masonic order, they've partnered with the, 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 the light is Luciferianism and they're waiting just like Mary received a 
overshadowing of the Holy Spirit that was holy, they are waiting for a person to be the incarnate Antichrist, to be born and to rule. What is it? Iron and clay. For, for evil to possess the vessels in an authority and a crushing power. Isn't that the picture and the type of, the, of Nero and some of these others of what they, the vileness to crush and to do whatever they want? Do you not think that there were not spirits operating in those evil in Nero? Absolutely, yes, Dennis. Excuse me? The Antichrist? There's not really, it's, it, there might be to the occult people, but to you and I, it's the issue of it is going to happen whether it's, whether it's done that way or not. What, I don't set my expectation on what an occult prophecy wants to have. I set my expectation on what does God say is gonna take place when he appears. And so we're, we're focused as Christians, I, I gotta keep going or I'm not gonna get anything done. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're focused on what? We're focused on when he appears, making sure we understand the time and the season and not to be deceived. Does that make sense? Because we, we were looking for our Christ already and we found him in the Messiah and the Jesus. We're not looking for anybody else. We know he'll show up. When he shows up, it actually says he's right at the door. So when, when the Antichrist appears and when, when the Bible says, and we've read it the last few uh, sessions we've been together, when the, uh, when the man of lawlessness is revealed, that's when the return of the Lord is nigh. Like nigh-nigh. We're in the last days, but when the Antichrist is revealed, that is the last of the last days. We're in the final season. Because really, we know that there's only gonna be about three and a half years of his rule, okay? So let's keep going. You guys doing okay? So we also know that Jesus Christ, so the dream, here's your fill-ins. The dream is prophecy, not history. So you have to understand that. When, when Daniel gets the interpretation of this dream, it's not history. Even though it is, it's prophecy, it's dual fulfillment. It is yes and yes. It's like looking at Troy and seeing Charlie. It's yes, Nebuchadnezzar is going to do this, but I am speaking to Satan. Sorry. Uh, I'm looking past the natural king, natural king to speak to the spiritual so-called king. And when Daniel gets that interpretation, he is getting a prophetic word from the Lord to declare who is the God of heaven and his full plan, okay? Let's keep going. Page, should be page six. Christ smashes the kingdoms of this world and establishes the kingdoms of God on the earth. And in the book of Daniel and Revelation, connects these truths with the image with the image dream. Daniel chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar then even after, this is the mind blower. Guys, if you can't see Satan in this, then we probably need to really pray for you. When God gives you a dream and he says, this is what's gonna happen to this image. It's gonna be destroyed. It's gonna have nothing of it left. That the God of heaven will fill the whole earth. Who in their right mind then goes ahead and builds the image that they saw get destroyed? Who does that? Beside us, right? If you know that God of heaven says this thing that was in your dream is going to get completely crushed and is going to be destroyed. And the interpretation is and the God of heaven is going to do it. It will come to pass. Then the next stage of your life, you decide to build that very image after you have the full interpretation. Well, I mean, Jan Venter says it best. 
how, how can you be so dumb and still breathe? I mean, I mean, I mean the, the reality is, I mean, the, that is the ultimate of pride, isn't it? That when God says what he says, and isn't that just like the people that turn when they've known the truth and have the full interpretation of truth, turn to try to build their own lives thinking they somehow will actually win. That is the nature. I mean, if I've ever talked to anybody that was in any form of hierarchy, of any form of, of Satanism that I've, been in, that I've encountered, they believe with all of their might that Satan is going to win on an appeal to prove God unrighteous and unholy. That's the ultimate thing. They believe that Satan will take over and has a just case in the court of law and God will be proven guilty. That's about as dumb as you can get, but that's how deluded Satan is. He believes that he has an appeal and an indictment against God. That's why he's constantly accusing the brethren. That's why he's constantly indicting God, saying God's not fair. If you talk to any Christian that has been bitter at God, what will they believe? They believe that God's not just with them. He's right with everybody else, but he's not fair with them. That comes from old Lou himself. And that's what they believe. And King Nebuchadnezzar, in his foolishness, he goes through a whole myriad of things that God absolutely humbles him. Now, he get, humbles him later in life, but man, you get the full interpretation of what God's going to do, and then you go build it and start killing people, and you manifest an antichrist spirit in the whole application of your kingdom. That's why it's so apropos that Daniel and Revelation fit together because there's no other place in which a king that represents Babylon, which represents the kingdom of evil and Antichrist, would have a system over the whole land with what? When you hear the music play, who was Lucifer? The anointed cherub that covered. You were perfect in all your way with your pipes and your timbrels. He was the sound of music. Isn't it interesting that the image had the music playing and there had to be a music in the background to bow to the deified image. And what was the penalty? It wasn't just off with your head. It was what? Fire. What did God say he would do to Lucifer? That he would turn through fire. Fire came out from you and consumed you. The Bible says in Isaiah and Ezekiel 28, and burnt you to ashes as you are displayed before the kings. The very fire of the passion of his lust for the power of God is what comes out of him. And what did he throw those that refused to bow in? He threw them into the fire. I mean, there, I mean, the imagery of the system of Antichrist is all through this image of the deified man. Are, are we doing okay? Okay, so when we get to this, it's repeated again in type and shadow in Revelation 13. Listen to Revelation 13, 11 through 18 again. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth, two horns like a lamb. But it spoke like a dragon. So what's it going to look like? It's going to appear like it's innocent. Like it's what? Clean. But its speech will speak like a dragon. How does a dragon speak? Well, none of us have probably gone to school for dragon speechology, oh, okay, or dragon talk 101, okay, but if you, if you understand that that's a spiritual term, what does a dragon speak? A dragon speaks with wisdom. What's the Chinese dragon known for? Wisdom. It's the ancient symbol of what? Of authority, but of wisdom. So it's going to sound it's going to look like a lamb. It's going to have wisdom. But the fact that it comes from a dragon means that if you don't listen to the wisdom, it's end is death. It's going to carry 
retribution. That's what a dragon does, right? Because what is it? What is a dragon? I mean, not that you've we've all studied dragons, but if you study it from the scripture, not from movies, okay, and certainly John, not Puff the Magic Dragon, okay, but but okay, I'm messing with you. Uh, but the reality is, if you study it from the scriptures, the dragon does what? It breathes fire. That when you move to not obey it, it's what? Its instant is to immediate retribution. That's not the lamb. It looks like a lamb, but its words are like the dragon. What did the dragon do? Well, we read it in chapter 12. It opens up its mouth and floods, tries to kill through the volume of words the woman that goes into the, what's it do? It's constantly always trying to destroy with its mouth anything that's in rebellion to its will and its ways. It'll look like a lamb, but its words will have vicious power. Does that make sense? All right, you're looking at me like, okay, well, whatever. All right, let's keep moving on. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in the presence and makes the earth and its habits worship the first beast. Again, what's it doing? The spirit of this false prophet or the spirit of this anti or this yeah, the false prophet is probably the best word I can have. This false prophet does what? Its spirit, its words, its signs is to all move to the image of the beast that has its power from the dragon. So here you see the three, the, tr the false trinity working. The dragon that gives its power to the beast, which is the Antichrist, and the false prophet. They're all working together. Same spirits working, giving honor, just like the Father gives the Son honor and the Son gave the Holy Spirit honor. What's now happening in the three and a half years? The dragon is giving his throne to the Antichrist, which is the exact same thing, only counterfeit, that the Father gave the Son. And then the son does what? In his ministry, he's always preferring the, the, the role of the Holy Spirit who is the prophetic voice of God that knows the mind and heart of God. And Jesus is always referring to when the another that comes that's just like me, when he comes. And what's happening here? You have the dragon representing the false father, giving his throne and his power to the Antichrist, and now another one comes along that does what? Causes the world, the, it's a, a false type of Holy Spirit, to worship the image, and then he gives life to the image. The Spirit gives the image life to both speak and talk. It's the false, the false trinity. I mean, it's counterfeit right on down from it blasphemes the Father, it blasphemes the Son, and it blasphemes the Holy Spirit. And then it says it performs great signs. Who's the power that performs great signs in the name of Christ? The Holy Spirit. What did the Pharisees call the power that Jesus was operating in that was from the Holy Spirit. They called him, he casts out demons by Beelzebub. This would not be the first time that a religious spirit that actually is in operation in Babylon would actually declare that something had power to cast out spirits and have authority in a demon prince. We see that back in Jesus' day. They just thought that they were coming, coming from a mindset condemning it, but they were actually revealing of whose father they really were. They were actually prophets of the dragon. All right, I'm moving on. I'm, I'm, I'm getting way too deep. Some of you are looking like, wow! All right, now. The signs that are allowed to work in the presence of the beast. Who's the beast again? The false Christ. So the, spirit, the false spirit works in the presence of the false Christ. How did Jesus and the Holy Spirit work? He worked in the presence of Christ when he was on the earth. It was allowed to what? Tell them to make an image. What are we told by God? Make no image. No image of heaven, no image of creature, no image of man. Any image is defiled. What does this do? 
moves to an image. Why? You have to move people to defilement to have legal right. That's how demonic spirits have right. They have a legal right because of defilement. And if he moves the whole earth into a defilement of worshiping the creature and the created rather than God, he's broken the law of God and done so through defilement over and over. It's a, the, everything the enemy does is steps of defilement. Because the minute you start worshiping idolatry or you worship the creature or the created and you move that way, the next step is now to take the mark. Give me the seal. Because if I put the whole world, if, if, if I'm the Antichrist and I put the whole world under the sway of my power and no one can make war with me, but I first have to start off by the worshiping of the image, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take what God did by putting an invisible seal on his own people that are marked by the seal of the Holy Spirit as the guarantee of their salvation. What am I going to do? Because of defilement now, I'm going to fool them. I'm just going to use you example. It's not, I'm not marking you in the real. Okay. Uh, I've got to do what? I've got to get you to put a mark on your head and on your hand that that's the seal that you're identify in me, in my image, in my defilement. And it removes you from ever, that's what the scripture says, from ever having your name in the book of life. It's the full process of defilement. Just like the Holy Spirit is the full process of of what? Acceptance in God. That's why, if I could go so strong here in the last two minutes, that's why when people won't accept the true signs and wonders from the Holy Spirit, the true evidences of the Holy Spirit, they're op I know you don't like to hear this, they're operating in a form of defilement that does not come from God. It comes from a blasphemous entity. That's a big deal. I said a mouthful there. It causes all, the great and small, rich and poor, free and slave. Do you hear the language? What is that a carbon copy of? Let me read it again. The rich, the poor, the great, the small, the poor, the free, or the, excuse me, the slave or free to be what? To be marked on the right hand of the forehead. What does that language sound like? There's neither male nor female, rich nor poor, slave nor free in Christ. All are one in Christ. What is the language here? All are one under the spirit of the Antichrist who get the what? Seal. Just like in Christ, there's no division when people receive his spirit unto liberty, in the Antichrist, when they receive his spirit, there is no liberty, all are locked up in defilement. One brings liberty out of all the divisions that once were of religion and the no's and do not taste and the do not touch and you're female, you can't go, you're Gentile, you can't go. In Christ, there is liberty and freedom to come to him in freedom, in the Antichrist, he offers freedom only to lock up in defilement. And it's through all classes. Then it says, and so no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. And that mark represents the name. The name of the beast and the number of its name. What do we say about the name of Jesus? His name is who he is. And who he is, is his name. That's why this is so important. It's a direct counterfeit of who the blasphemous 180 degree turn of who Jesus is. Why? Because when I call on the name of Jesus, if I'm, if I'm praying for, let's say I'm praying for Troy's shoulder to get healed, I call on his name. It is who he is. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is healer. He is all that I need him to be because his name represents the fullness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and every identity that he has ever covenanted with man is summed up in Jesus Christ.
So his name is his presence. His name is his word. His name is every aspect of what he's declared in the Bible. The opposite of that then would be what? When the mark is released, I'll go over to you, because you picked on me tonight. Because when the mark is released and you take it in your head or in your hand, okay, when you take it, what happens? You are receiving the fullness of his nature, of who he was always declared to be. A thief, a murderer, and a liar. And all that's been revealed. He is dragon, he is serpent, he is wolf, he is the devil, the faults, the enmity, everything that God hates is wrapped up in that name. He is sin personified. And, we, and somebody takes that mark, they're taking every attribute of who the devil is. Does that make sense? You doing all right? Shall we pray you up onto a high place that you, Jesus loves you and thank God you're saved? Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you tonight. Lord, your word is incredible. Lord, the things that are there, Lord, to reveal to us that we would not be deceived, but that we would see it and that we would stand strong no matter the climate that comes on the earth. No matter the climate that comes on the earth, we are preserved by your name, by your grace, and by the seal of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, that you have redeemed us out of the world and caused us to know life. Lord, we treasure your life. It is more precious than anything, gold, silver, or precious stone. Your life is precious worth it all to us. We love you and we bless you. Now bring the people back this weekend. Let them come to church in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great evening. <laughs>